You know, when I started this channel, I had absolutely no idea where it was gonna go or where we would end up. Two years later, we just surpassed 10,000 subscribers. What's going on guys? My name is David Tomich and welcome back to the channel. Today is a very special and very momentous day for me because we've just surpassed 10,000 subscribers on this channel. Like I said, I didn't really know where this channel was gonna go from the start. I wasn't really sure what we were gonna do with it. It started off as a fitness vlog with a little bit of technology mixed in between and it slowly progressed to some sort of tech reviews. Eventually, I figured out that I was kind of out of my element with technology reviews because I couldn't actually financially afford to be buying the latest and greatest tech every single week. It ended up just putting me in a massive hole and getting no return. So I thought I might as well do what I'm truly passionate about and talk to you guys about architecture and mix it in with technology as much as possible. Over the past few months, I have been doing a lot more architecture related videos and Archicad related tutorials which you guys have been absolutely loving and it has made this channel grow immensely, especially over the last two, three months where it's just spiked like crazy. So before we really dive into this Q&A where I got all these questions from Instagram from you guys, I just wanted to say thank you for supporting me, thank you for supporting this channel and together over the next few years, we're gonna to continue to grow this to the best community we absolutely can. I know personally as an architect, it's very hard to communicate about architecture with other architects. Everything seems to be a secret for some reason, but I don't really want it to be that way. I wanna be able to change the world somehow, some way, shape or form, and in some weird way, this is my way of doing that. So there is a Discord link down below. If you guys wanna join the Discord group and start building this community even more so, so whenever you need some help, if it's architecture related, if it's student related, hopefully either myself or somebody in the community can help you. But without further ado, I think we should start getting into these questions. I took notes over the week of all the questions that came through and I thought there was a couple good ones in there. So I picked out, I think my top 15 or 16 there is here. And I just really wanted to just share my experience with you guys and answer the questions that you have. Usually I reply to every single comment you make on YouTube, but there's some questions that just genuinely need some sort of realistic personal touch. So I'll literally go at no particular order whatsoever and I'm gonna go through the list as I wrote them down and as they came in. If this question does come from you, thank you so much for asking the question. I hope I've answered it exactly how you were looking for. The first question is, do you prefer Revit or Archicad? I think that's kind of become more apparent over the past couple of years. It's more so moving towards Archicad than Revit. Revit was my bread and butter. It's where I learned the basics of architecture. It's where I learned to become an architect. But Archicad is something that I've adopted over the past couple of years and I've actually grown to like it so much more. I think now Archicad is my preferred software, even though I still do believe Revit has so many more features that Archicad doesn't, but I do believe for my situation and the purposes of what I do in day-to-day -day life, Archicad is a much better software. The next question is, do you use Photoshop, InDesign, or Illustrator much? If yes, how did you learn it? Um, I don't use InDesign and Illustrator that much. I do use Photoshop quite often. I think InDesign, we kind of get the grads to do that more so to compile documents and presentation bits and pieces, but it was definitely something I have used and I do know very well. I know the whole Adobe Suite pretty well actually. It's something I learned in university. So I started my university life as a psychology undergrad. I decided that wasn't for me, so I transferred into a graphic design course because architecture only actually started at the start of the year and I wanted to transition midway through. So I decided to not waste time, not go on the workforce and pick up a skill that might actually help me in architecture career. So yeah, I did graphic design for six months where I learned Photoshop, Illustrator, InDesign, uh, Premiere Pro, basically the whole Adobe suite. And that skill has literally helped me from day one in my architecture career and at university all the way now as a fully qualified architect. The next question is, did you mostly learn CAD through uni or did you have to self teach yourself? Um, it's a bit of a mixed bag because at university, at least at my university, everything was self taught. We had a small Revit class that ran for one semester and they taught you the absolute basics. But I wanted to know all the programs to be able to kind of best position myself when I came out of university for the workforce. So I learned Archicad, I learned Rhino, I learned AutoCAD, I learned Archicad, I learned them all during university myself. And then obviously as I transitioned into the workforce, I learned more and more of these skills. My first job was at a Revit firm, so I learned Revit quite well. And then I progressed into Archicad firms from there and I've used Archicad since. So it's a bit of a mix, originally self-taught and then obviously taught by the people 
that know it better than me who have been working in the field longer than me. Pros and cons of becoming a drafts person versus a qualified architect. Um, I guess this question is hard to answer because the situation around the world is completely different for drafts people and architects. In my personal experience, I guess drafts people don't really design as much as architects. The whole purpose of an architect is to be able to get that experience and qualifications into the design elements. So we start from sketch design with the very first sketch and work it all the way through the project. Whereas a drafts person kind of gets handed over the job at a certain point, in my experience at least. It could be different around the world. Um, I think the pros and cons are kind of simple, more creativity and more freedom as an architect, kind of more of a very repetitive job as a drafts person. The pay is obviously greater as an architect versus a drafts person because obviously you have a higher set of qualifications and a degree in architecture as well as multiple years experience. You have all sorts of uh, criteria that you have to fill, whereas for a drafts person, you don't have to have the same qualifications. It's a much quicker course, a much shorter course, but that doesn't take anything away from drafts people. They do know how to do construction details, sometimes a lot better than architects, because that is their job to know how to detail and how to construct drawings a lot better than what architects necessarily might know or do know. Did you make this with twin motion? They're referring to this render here that I posted on my Instagram a couple days ago. Yes, that was made with twin motion with a little bit of Photoshop afterwards. So I think from memory, all I did was export it in twin motion and then I did a sky replacement in Photoshop because the skies in twin motion are a bit average. Um, there wasn't really too much more in Photoshop, literally a 30 second sky replacement. So yep, most of the renders you see on my page are done with twin motion. If they're not, I'll specify it or I'll tag somebody that I collaborated with to create that render. This is a big question because it's something that applies to a lot of people, including myself at the start. How do I find a job with zero experience if every application ad asks for two years minimum? It's a very tough question because I go out and hire new grads now and I look for a magnitude of different things. Most of the time I do ask for some experience, but it's not always necessary. I think you have to position yourself in the best way possible and position your portfolio to that firm. So if they are asking for two years experience, you can still apply, that doesn't mean you won't get it. But if you do need that two years experience and you're seeing yourself knocked back over and over and over again, then just go out and get a temporary free unpaid summer internship or a winter internship. Geez, do it for a whole year if you have to. I know I did about three months of unpaid interns before I got my first paid job because to be honest, even as a Masters of Architecture graduate with a fully five-year qualified degree at university, you still don't know anything in the field. It took me a very long time to figure that out, but eventually I did and I realized that I was way too cocky coming out of university as what I should be. So I think that's why most people actually put in that two years minimum experience because you realize how much you don't know and how much more you have to learn and that puts you in a much stronger position. Next question is, how beneficial is ARCHICAD for quantity surveyors? Can they become an architect too? Multiple part question, I guess. Anybody can become an architect as long as you have the correct qualifications and you've gone down the right pathway. Um, if you're a fully qualified quantity surveyor, there is some benefits to using ARCHICAD. I guess there is uh, ways you can implement quantity surveying into ARCHICAD so you could get an architect to send you their model and you could implement that into your software with all your data and know exactly how much that building is going to cost. There is a lot better quantity surveying softwares out there. You wouldn't necessarily be going to ARCHICAD for a QS position. Um, so I think there is benefit in learning it. You know how to manipulate models. You can check out bits and pieces but you probably only need to learn the basics. You wouldn't have to learn anything further. Next question is, how would you rank your top five passions, gym, architecture, technology, etc.? First and foremost, I think my biggest passion is being somewhat of an entrepreneur. I've been an entrepreneur ever since I was about 18. I've pushed my own businesses. I've tried to build my own brands. I've dedicated my time to helping others grow their businesses and just being a better business person in general. So I find myself always positioned in an area where I am the entrepreneur in the situation. Um, that would be my biggest passion. And then I guess architecture would follow suit. Following that, it would actually be fitness. It would be the gym only because I think all the workload and stress of being an entrepreneur and being an architect and having a full-time job, multiple businesses on the side, multiple companies running at the same time, um, international, ventures and all sorts of bits and pieces, you end up just losing so much sleep and just getting absolutely wrecked sometimes. So from a mental point of view and just self-care and self-discipline, I think fitness comes in at number three for me because 
it's just genuinely a stress relief and it helps me clear my mind in the mornings and then start my day as best as possible. After that, technology would come in at a very close fourth. Um, I absolutely love technology. I love buying new tech. It always excites me opening up technology and ripping it open, playing with it the first time, setting it up. It's just, I don't know, it's something about it that I've loved ever since I was a kid. Ever since I used to play video games as a kid, I always just loved technology as much as I could. Question is, do you think you need to be, be super creative to become a drafts person or an architect? Uh, yes and no, you don't really need to be super creative to become a drafts person. You're usually told what to do or how to do something. You need to be quite creative in a sense to be able to problem solve, but I don't think you need to be creative in a sense to understand materiality, shapes, and all the things that an architect does in the early stages. You don't exactly need to be creative as an architect either. You can be very successful by doing just plain boxes. Um, minimalistic architecture, in my opinion, is one of the hardest things to successfully achieve. And most people just go, well, it's just a box. But to somebody who has truly mastered minimalistic architecture, it is the most creative, but yet the least creative thing you can do. But again, not taking anything away from drafts people because they do an exceptional job at what their job is. Every job role is very different and I think we have to understand what one job role is versus what another job role is. Would be keen to know more about workflow utilizing the renovations tool, how best to model your existing, then add proposed designs. I did a video a couple weeks back on renovation layers and how I use them. It was more so about setting up renovation layers than anything else. Um, the way I do it personally is I model the whole building that I'm working with if it's an alteration addition and then I look at it from a structural point of view as to not blow out costs. So if I was going to go blow out costs, I just knock the whole thing down, start again because it's much more feasible. But the reason you keep an alteration addition is to keep the solid and structural elements going so you can just build up and build around and not have to worry about spending that 150, 200, 300,000, whatever it might be that's already there. So for me, it's about learning the floor plans, learning what that existing area is, and then building and designing something that works to that rather than completely against that. So it's to complement the existing design as much as possible and to utilize the existing structure as much as possible. Uh, this question was actually asked a couple times in a couple different ways. So the simplest way I wrote this one down is what's the best way to prepare for architecture school. Architecture school is diverse and it's different and it's strange. It doesn't matter where you study it across the world. My first day was life drawings of naked people. Not what I'd expect at university as an architecture student. Um, and then I got a bit more creative and a bit more different. So preparing for architecture school is more so about preparing yourself for the curriculum and understanding what you're getting into read the curriculum, learn what programs they use, learn what they're expecting, check out what some of the current students are doing, see if you have any idea of how they even got to that point, um, learn things like Photoshop, InDesign, Illustrator, uh, Archicad, AutoCAD, Revit, learn as much as you can to prepare or at least just watch YouTube videos on it so you know the fundamental basics. You're gonna be absolutely overwhelmed at architecture school, it doesn't matter how much you prepare because there is so much to learn so just take it with a pinch of salt, go in with an open mind, and remember to keep pushing through because the first couple of years of architecture school are by far the hardest, they're the most challenging, and they really get you to start thinking differently, especially coming straight out of high school. So don't be afraid in university, just go in with an open mind and keep going is my only advice really. How much technical drawing does one do in architecture school? This does vary depending on schools. So I know we didn't do very much. We did very minimal technical drawing. Um, we had one unit on it every single semester, but it wasn't amazing. Like I'm not gonna lie, it wasn't the best technical drawing. I didn't learn a lot. I definitely learned a lot more going out to the practice in the real world. Um, so you will do some, but you kind of babied your way through it. At, well, in my experience, maybe in different universities and different colleges, you have a much different experience, but usually it does form one of your four core subjects at university per semester. Uh, how much math does one do in architecture school and do I need to be super good at it? Uh, I genuinely don't do very much math in architecture. It's very simple maths. Um, to be fair though, and to be honest, I've been very good at math during high school, during university and everything. It was one of my best subjects. So math kind of came naturally to me. Um, it's not something you specifically need every day, but you do need to 
I don't know, add, subtract, to multiply the basics. You don't need to go and learn physics and you don't really need to go and learn what engineers learn. Um, but having said that, I know America, for example, as an architect, you do a lot more in an architect's role than you do in an Australian architect's role. And that's why our degrees aren't recognized in different countries because we all have different rules, different regulations and different understandings of the job role. So in Australia, at least, you don't need to know an excessive amount of maths, but it's always good to know the fundamental basics, which I'm sure you probably have to know to get into university at some way, shape or form. Can you speak Serbian? Do you have Balkan roots? Yes, yes, I can speak Serbian, I can speak Croatian. Technically, it's the same language, just different dialogue. Um, I was born in Bosnia. I was raised there for a few years and we moved to Australia when I was three. So I do have Balkan roots. I haven't been back for a very, very long time, nor do I think I'll be going back at any point in time soon because of the whole COVID situation. So um, yes, I can speak Serbian. If you do comment in Serbian or in Croatian down below, I tend to reply in Serbian and Croatian if you've noticed. Um, but yeah, I guess English is now my first language because I learned Croatian first, I spoke it till I was three, and then I started speaking English since, and I only spoke Croatian at home to my parents and to my grandma, because my grandma, of course, didn't know any English. She was in her late 60s when we moved, um, and she never really learned English, so it was the only way I could communicate with her. Last question, Mac or Microsoft, pros and cons for each? That is a huge, huge, huge question that I could talk about for hours and hours and hours. Um, simplest way to put it, Mac is more user-friendly, Windows is more tech-friendly, so if you're a bit of a geek like me and understand technology a little bit more, Windows is super helpful because you can manipulate it and play with it and do whatever you want. Uh, most custom PCs are a lot more powerful than any Mac OS computer that's out on the market at the moment. The Mac M1 chip at the moment is killing it. It is pushing some numbers way better than anything that is on the market for an Intel chip. So. I don't know, maybe in the next couple of years, depending on what how Apple actually pushes their chips and what they plan on doing, Apple M1 chips might be a lot more powerful and better at graphics processing than a Windows PC, but yet to see. Um, if you just wanna get on with your day and have a really good UI, Mac for sure. If you wanna kinda of spend a bit more time nerding out about it, Windows, always the best option. Anyway, that's all the questions from you guys today. Thank you so much for taking the time to putting those together. It truly does mean something to me because all these videos that I've put out for you guys, it means that somebody is actually watching and it makes it a little bit more real. It's not that number just ticking over and over and over every day and going up and up and up. It's actual genuine real life people around the world coming together, creating a community, asking questions, growing together. So I know we are still a very small community on the YouTube scale. 10,000 is a huge number for me and a very big success in my goals for this year. I was aiming for about 10,000 at the end of the year. We're only in May. We're so far ahead of schedule, which is absolutely incredible. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, make sure you smash that subscribe button down below. Hit that like button too. Apparently it helps with the YouTube algorithm. I know it's been helping in the past few weeks, so thank you for hitting it. And as always, I will see you next Monday.